Okay, hello, wildlifers. I uh, hope you are all doing fine. Uh, we, members of Rotary Fellowship of Wildlifers for Conservation, share a common interest that is uh, wildlife and its conservation, willing to work with the 118 year old organization Rotary towards building a future in which people and nature thrive. Uh, to share a few notes about our fellowship group, uh, we are a group of around uh, 500 plus interested individuals who have globally united around common interest with the primary purpose to network and uh, further friendship. Although our fellowship activities are uh, uh, conducted independently of uh, uh, Rotary International, they are in harmony with uh, Rotary policies. Our purpose is to create awareness about importance of wildlife, to promote lasting friendships outside one's own club, district and country, and globally, um, and regionally. And uh, 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 a Rotary Club is a member of Rotary International and a Rotary Fellowship is a group of like-minded individuals driven by Rotarians beyond their uh, clubs. So today uh, we have invited uh, members of Rotary Clubs and uh, friends from Rotary uh, from different parts of the world uh, for this meeting. Uh, a hearty and a warm welcome to each one of you. Um, on behalf of Wildlifers, I also extend a very warm Welcome to our distinguished uh, speaker, Mr. Jayant Sharma. Uh, Mr. Jayant Sharma is a co-founder and CEO of uh, um, uh, Toe Hold uh, Photography. Uh, he's an award-winning wildlife photographer. Jayant took up serious photography in 2004 and after gradually moving out of his day job to pursue his passion full-time, co-founded Toe Hold in 2010. Effortlessly combining natural history and fine art, fine art elements, Jayant brings back rarely seen perspectives from the little visited domains and far corners of the natural world. Traveling is oxygen for Jayant, and he wants to explore all possible natural hotspots of the world while he is on the planet. Uh, his unique expertise in photographing in a truly eccentric range of uh, wilderness areas uh, from Southeast Asia to Canada, Brazil to Norway and East Africa to Eastern Russia is supplemented by his immense experience in the Indian subcontinent. Having worked in mighty Himalayas, uh, the unexplored Northeast, the secretive South and the tiger heavens of Central India, Jayant is a hometown photographer gone totally global. Having worked uh, uh, participants of the office photo tours uh, find him not only an acutely brilliant mentor, well, I have had, I have had the personal experience, uh, but also a sparkling inspiration to conceive and execute images they had hitherto probably never imagined. Now I will uh, hand over the session to Jayant. Uh, once uh, uh, Jayant uh, uh, completes, we will have a um, question and answer session. If you have any uh, questions, uh, you can even type in uh, the chat box. Please mute yourselves uh, during the talk. Uh, we will have uh, and uh, Rotarian Shankar Subramaniam will moderate the session. Over to you, Jayant. Thank you. Thank you. So, Sanjay, I have 45 minutes, did you say? Yes, yes, Jay. Okay, great. Fantastic. All right. So, thank you, everybody. Uh, that was a uh, reasonably long introduction. Thanks for that, Sanjay. So, I won't waste time because I have a lot of things to share. So, today's presentation is about one of the areas in the world. I just want to make sure uh, the right presentation is on. Let me switch. Is it okay now? You're able to see me. Yes, yes, uh, yes. Okay, great. So uh, one of the most favorite areas for me as a wildlife enthusiast and then a photographer is, of course, the polar regions. So I just want to spend uh, the next few minutes uh, sharing some of my experiences of this place. Of course, showcasing some of my photographs, telling you stories about this. And I'm sure um, if even a couple of you are inspired to try and go here in uh, your lifetime, that will be a great thing to do before uh, it's too late, I think. So um, I mean, about 17, 18 years ago, I started 
getting involved in photography very seriously. And uh, very soon I realized because of the digital um, photography evolving, there were many, many, many people getting into photography. So I needed something what we call in business management language as a theory of uh, blue ocean strategy, which means I had to find some areas in the world where Indian photographers were not frequenting so that whatever I bring, even if it's not outstanding, it will get a special attention. Otherwise, um, in India, I found myself amidst a lot of people who had uh, around the same areas of work like Bandipur, Nagarhole, you know, Bandhavgarh, Anthambore and stuff like that. So the Arctic for me opened up a new horizon quite literally. So um, I call this uh, presentation the ends of the earth, uh, wildlife around the Arctic and Antarctica. So before I begin, I'd like to ask you guys a question. You can type in the chat if you want to answer it. What is the difference between the Arctic and Antarctica, apart from it being in the north and Antarctica being in the south? Anybody knows? What's the major difference between the Arctic and Antarctic? Um, I'll leave you with that thought for a minute. If anybody knows the answer, that will be great to know. Uh, I'll come back to answering that myself in maybe less than a minute's time. So um, I have over 60 pictures that I put together for this presentation to show you. Um, I may skip through some of them in the interest of time and I'll focus on some if there are some stories to tell you about it. So in the, um, looks like nobody's giving me the answer, so I'll tell you, Antarctica is a permanent land mass. It's actually a continent. Arctic is habitat and Antarctic is uninhabited except research station. Well, that's um, partially true, Shashi, uh, Pabati. Even, even the Arctic has nowadays some permanent settlements. Like, for example, we'll see about that in a bit. The biggest difference is this. Antarctica is a land. Arctic is an ocean. So there is um, the Arctic Ocean. So it's basically a lot of archipelagos and islands, which is a part of this area called the Arctic Ocean. Antarctica is land around which there is the southern oceans. Antarctica is permanent land, whereas in the Arctic, there are some small archipelagos, but the ocean around is what is call, called the Arctic. So um, basically what happens in these two areas, all of you know, there is the ice caps, and which is why there is a very varying wildlife um, in these two areas. And like somebody said, Vikram says, in the Antarctic area, there are the penguins, and in the Arctic area, there are the polar bears and they never meet because they have never crossed each other except some birds like the arctic terns which migrate between the two areas very very few animals can move between these two areas so one of the most important things to consider for us is the geography of the planet now um the the area in the top and the bottom are the arctic and antarctic um all of you must know 66 degrees north is where the arctic starts and the same in the south as well that's the arctic circle and the antarctic circle now, the green area that I have marked on the screen is uh, was it what is called as um, the tropics, like Tropic of Cancer, Tropic of Capricorn. In the middle of the two is this beautiful area called the tropical region. Now, between the Arctic and the Tropic of Cancer, there are subtropical areas and then the temperate areas. A lot of this world is a temperate region, especially the northern hemisphere. In the southern hemisphere, we hardly have any areas except some parts of Australia and New Zealand and maybe even South America. Now, um, I uh, started wondering about the Arctic basically because of the polar bears, because it's one of my favorite animals. I remember in 2011, I actually went to this area in Canada. It is called Churchill. It's uh, called Churchill. It's in the state of Manitoba. I went to Canada. It's just next to the Hudson Bay. And I found um, this place to be one of the best places in the world. In fact, North American tourism industry markets this place as the polar bear capital of the world. So I went here. Um, in fact, it's a beautiful area. It's actually not the Arctic. Many of us believe polar bears are in the Arctic. This is one exceptional place where polar bears are actually in the temperate zone. They come down into the temperate zone. If you see the map here, um, if you see the arrow near Churchill, Manitoba, that area is called the Hudson Bay. What happens during the fall and after fall during the winter is the Hudson Bay freezes. When Hudson Bay freezes, the polar bears start coming down from the north and they continue walking on water, which is now ice, and they come down looking for, you know, some interesting things to find. And then by the time they've reached Manitoba and Churchill, they don't have any more sea and they're actually waiting for the sea to again freeze. In the summer, they're actually in Churchill, which is actually uh, in the middle of fire, uh, you know, uh, weed, as they call it, the purple flowers and stuff like that. So polar bears can be found in grasslands in 
the Churchill area during June, July, perhaps. Now they're waiting for the Hudson Bay to freeze so that they can get back to the ocean and then get into the Arctic area. So if you notice, it's at least 10 degrees below the Arctic Circle. And that's where the polar bears are hanging around. This is the first area I visited. Very interesting place. In fact, as I said, it's a temperate area, a lot of pine trees. In fact, the Arctic doesn't have any trees. So this is a beautiful area where there's a small little town called Churchill, as I said. Now, the beauty of this place is about 900,000 people are um, going to live here you know, throughout the year. And the fun part of this place is it doesn't have any road connectivity to any other city in the world, which means you have to either take a train or you have to fly to reach this town called Churchill. Uh, this is basically called the polar bear capital of the world. An interesting fact, here there are a few hundred cars and people do not lock their cars because, you know, when somebody is shopping and they're going to the store and coming back home, it's already so cold. And in the middle of that, if there is a polar bear on the street, which is very possible here, then people can run to the nearest car and close the door rather than, you know, finding the keys. There's no time for all of that. And that's an interesting fact about this particular place called Churchill. Now, in this area, when I visited in order to find polar bears, in four days, I must have counted over 200 bears. It was overwhelming. I really didn't think I'll see so many bears. How did we find bears here? There is this vehicle which is modified for polar bear tourism. It is called the Thundra Buggy. It's a brand now. It's called the Thundra Buggy. It's basically an oversized truck and people are accommodated in this truck. And the window is at least about nine feet above the ground so that if a polar bear comes and stands on its uh, hind leg into the window, its nose cannot reach the window. That's the kind of design here. Of course, where you see the people, those are the stairs where they're getting down. So this is a place where a lot of males, subadults, are hanging around waiting for the sea ice to form. So this is a great time of the year to go ahead and see polar bears sparring and play fighting. They're actually not fighting. They're trying to be active and play fighting. So that's a beautiful sight here to see polar bears fights. Now, this is actually a season which is November probably. That's what is called the fall in the North American region. And that's when you start seeing snowing and the whole landscape is white and stuff like that. Um, Arctic foxes. This is how they look in the uh, in the winter. And just to show you, this is how they look in the summer. Their coat changes because the landscape changes. Probably a camouflage mechanism for them. In the winter, it's so white, so they need to be completely hidden in the landscape. So they change their colors. And in the uh, summer, they also get this gray coat. All right. So this was the area which I first visited. And I had an overwhelming amount of polar bear encounters here. But I must tell you that I felt a little, um, what can I say? I was not really satisfied because I wanted to see the Arctic. And here I was seeing one of Arctic's most favorite uh, animal, but not in the Arctic at all. So that got me back to base where I started wondering what should I do, where should I go and stuff like that. That's when I discovered another beautiful place. By the way, this is a polar bear standing and looking at me while I'm seeing down from the Thundra buggy. It's trying to reach out, but it cannot. You know, an interesting fact about polar bear, its forearms cannot extend beyond its head. It cannot do what we are doing. It cannot do this. It can only put the hand still here because of the design of the body. So we can be very sure that it cannot swipe up. And uh, when we are looking down, that's the kind of uh, guarantee that I can give you when it comes to polar bears. It's a beautiful place where helicopter tourism is also very, very uh, rampant here. We can take a helicopter for $500 and we can scan the area and find 15, 20 bears in one afternoon, probably in less than an hour because they're all around the area. Also, a little bit south of um, the Arctic Circle is Iceland. In fact, Iceland as the mainland has a small island about 30, 40 kilometers off the mainland. And that's a small island called Grimsey. And the Arctic Circle touches this particular island. That's why Iceland says we are in the Arctic Circle. In fact, 100% of Iceland's mainland is outside the Arctic Circle, except this Chota Island, which is inside the Arctic Circle. That's why Iceland say we are Arctic. But anyway, Iceland is a great place to see some of the characteristics of an Arctic, you know, for example, the Aurora Borealis and stuff like that. So these are areas where wildlife is less, but nevertheless, the landscape is beautiful and has all the characteristics of being in the Arctic. Now, the area that I figured and I feel that's one of the most uh, important places in my life um, as a photographer, as a nature lover, is this area called Svalbard. It's a part of um, the northern, um, you know, uh, area in Europe. I'll tell you some interesting facts about this place. Svalbard doesn't belong to any country. Svalbard is a no man's land. However, 
Norway decides to administer this. Everybody in the world used to go and plunder in Svalbard. Like, for example, the Vikings used to go and do whaling. A lot of European uh, shipping companies used to go there and bring back a lot of, uh, you know, meat or some of the coal miners used to go and mine coal there. A few uh, decades ago, maybe in the 70s, a lot of countries signed something called the Svalbard Treaty. And they said, this is pristine wilderness. We should not plunder this uh, place uh, because all of you are wildlife enthusiasts and conservation oriented people. I'm telling you all of this. So they decided to sign this treaty and they said this area, which belongs to nobody, is going to be administered by the nearest guy who is Norway. And we will not plunder this place like Vikings have been doing it for the last 300, 400 years. So since then, the wildlife has been thriving here. And polar bear tourism in Svalbard is probably one of the most important reasons why people go there. Now, in this place, um, somebody mentioned, right, um, uh, Shashi. So this is a small town here in the archipelago of Svalbard called Longyear Ben, Longyear City, as they call it. This is a uh, town where people live throughout the year. This is a permanent settlement where people have cars, they have you know uh, an airstrip, they have an airport. And on the opposite bank of this city is another small town called Barentsburg, which is Russian. When Russia was mining, they were there. Now they have left the city except Lenin, Lenin's face. Everything is gone there. Uh, and of course, uh, there are people who come there to do research and stuff like that. Now, when we start the polar bear tourism, this is the town from where we begin. And sometimes we go all the way north of this ar archipelago. And for example, in this example, I have gone to 81 degrees and 39 minutes, which is probably half a day away sailing from the northern tip of this archipelago. Why? Because every year the ice sheet is different. Every year, for example, I don't know how many of you heard of something called El Nino. Because of the ocean warming, the ice is less. Some years, very bad ice. Some years, there's a lot of ice. So one of the years, I went to 81 degrees. One year, I went to 82 degrees as well, about two days away from land to find ice. Why do we need to find ice? In the open sea, an interesting fact, polar bears are classified as marine mammals, which means they are the largest land carnivore, but they are still marine mammals. It's an interesting fact, right? Largest land carnivore and a marine mammal. That's because they spend a majority of their life on um, the sea. They walk around on the sea. Of course, there's ice beneath. That is why they can walk around on sea. Unlike Jesus Christ, they can't walk on water. But um, because they hunt and feed on marine life, they live on the marine ecosystem. They are classified as marine mammals. And of course, they are the largest land carnivore. This one area which I scanned in one of my expeditions. Just for records, I have been to the Arctic over 12 times, which is my life's biggest achievement in my opinion, because quite an expensive place. Just for records, it may cost anything from a $7,000 trip in a 50-people ship to a $10,000 trip in a 12-people ship. And I operate tours here. I take people here to you know, show them the Arctic. So I have been fortunate to go there again and again. So how do we travel in the Arctic is basically using a ship. On the ship, we traverse the whole archipelago and whenever we feel there's something interesting, we stop by and we use a crane and put our uh, zodiacs, as we call it, the rubber boats on the on the water and we jump into the, uh, uh, um, what do you call it, the zodiacs and we start going closer to the wildlife. So this is basically a view from uh, Leonardo DiCaprio and Kate Wins Winslet's position. You're seeing uh, this particular view here. So I basically... Um, Enjoy photography in the Arctic because it gives you a different perspective. I'm in front of this glacier called the Monaco Glacier in this case. So Monaco Glacier is um, an area where it has a big bay and in front of it, you can see this huge amount of ice. Just to give you a perspective on conservation, I went to this place for the first time in 2012. Uh, in fact, I still remember Mr. Kulkarni when I met you in June 2012 in Delhi, I had coincided that with my Norway visa interview. That's how I remember the date so well. In fact, from 2012 to 2019, I can see this glacier reducing in size in my own lifetime. Imagine what would have happened 100 years ago to what it is now. So glaciers are melting at a rapid pace. And somebody like me, who is just about 42 years old, can see it in my own lifetime. Imagine what an 80-year-old guy can notice. Imagine what 200 years of pictures can show and document this particular thing. So it's very interesting. It's one of the places where... All these words, climate change, global warming, all of these words have uh, a picture in front of your eyes. Otherwise, sitting in Bengaluru, we can't understand 
oh, this year summer is very high kind of a thing, but there you see it in front of your eyes. That is the biggest um, uh, you know, mirror to what's happening in this globe, I feel. So uh, Svalbard is an area where it has the world's third largest glacier, 180 kilometers long, about 100 meters high, ice, permanent ice, like Antarctica and Greenland. This is the third largest glacier called Ostfona. It has these waterfalls and beautiful area that I enjoy photographing. Apart from just doing wildlife, there's also a lot of landscape opportunities here. So one of the interesting things for people who don't know much about the Arctic is during the months of June, July, August, some part of September, it has 24 hours sunlight. There's no night at all here. It has 24 hours sunlight. And of course, in December, end of November onwards, there'll be pitch darkness for about 90 days to 110 days, pitch dark, uh, no light at all. That's the beauty of the Arctic. So this is a midnight shot. I timed my picture at 12 o'clock at midnight and photographed this. And that's the beauty of the midnight sun. A lot of people come to the Arctic, it seems, to see the midnight sun. They think it will be something different, but it will be just like how it is in Bangalore at 12 o'clock in the afternoon. Some wildlife around here, the Svalbard reindeer, one of the most interesting species. A lot of polar bears hunt them as well. Um, one more recovery of conservation um, uh, success is, of course, this beautiful animal called the walrus. They had been reduced to a few hundred individuals about 20 years ago. Because of the treaty and the protection in Svalbard, they have recovered a lot. Now there are a few thousands of them. And they move between different archipelagos. Like there's one area called Franz Joseph Island in Russia. They keep moving around in these areas. But Svalbard is a great place to see the walrus up close. In fact, this is a big male. Um, I have uh, been sleeping on the beach with the camera and the male comes to figure out what this guy is doing. That's how I could get so close to this particular individual. A lot of seals, one of the most favorite food of polar bears, of course, is the walrus. Uh, polar bears love to hunt uh, underwater, as I said. They walk uh, on ice and they hide and they, um, you know, get down and dive and go and catch the seals sometimes and they get lucky once in a while. And of course, it's a great place to photograph polar bears on ice, inland, in front of glaciers. And there's also something interesting. These are called fjords. The spelling is F-J-O-R-D, fjord. So fjords are areas which start from the glacier's mouth and go and, you know, get into the sea. A lot of polar bears in the summer stay in these kind of fjords. Of course, um, I don't know how many of you know the plight of polar bear mothers and cubs. Um, polar bears need ice. Without ice, they cannot survive. You can see this polar bear is on land. There's no ice for 100 kilometers from where I photographed this polar bear mother and uh, cub. If there is no ice, it means there is no food. There is a little food in the summer in the form of birds, uh, in the form of you know, chicks, in the form of eggs and stuff like that. But how much can polar bears feed on these small eggs and chicks? They need big blabber animals like the seals. So this is a mother and a polar bear cub photographed in the summer. And uh, you, as you can see, there's no ice at all here. Some years are very dry in the summer. In front of the glacier, of course, there's a lot of interesting uh, sites because glacier ice is going to be this kind of blue because of compression of um, you know decades and decades, hundreds of years of ice getting compressed uh, this is the color it gets. And of course, the reflection of this glacier in the water and a polar bear in that would be magical to have. This was my first ever polar bear sighting in Svalbard after the 200 bears in uh, Churchill that I had seen. So I would love to see questions. Um, somebody has made a remark. I would not be able to read long paragraphs while I'm talking, but I'll make it a point to go to that later on. So um, one of the dreams for a wildlife enthusiast who goes to Svalbard is to not just see a polar bear. They will definitely see a polar bear is to see polar bear on ice. Polar bear on land is reasonably possible because you know if you go to some areas where there are polar bears trapped on islands, they don't have anywhere to go. So they'll stay there. They'll feed on some birds. They'll hunt some reindeer and they'll stay there till the ice comes back. Once the ice comes back, they have something under their feet to walk away from those islands. So polar bears on ice has been one of my dreams. And I started finding the real time of the year to go to the real places to photograph polar bears on ice. Some of my best um, you know, artistic pictures are from the Arctic. Some of my award-winning pictures are from the Arctic because the beauty of Arctic is it allows you time. It allows you angles in a, in a Ranthambore safari. If you're on the road, the tiger is in the bush. You can stand only in that place, maybe move around here and there. But in the Arctic, this polar bear on the ice, I can move my zodiac 360 degrees, front light, side light, back light, whatever I want. 
to try and experiment with creativity and not just make documentary photograph. That is what I love about my um, wildlife photography style. Not just polar bears, a lot of birds, a lot of other wildlife as well. Just to give you a BTS or a behind the scene perspective of how we find polar bears is um, something like this. So we are two zodiacs, about 12 of us, six people in each zodiac. And we were just going around this island called Kwitoya or the White Island. For people who are interested in um, adventure, it seems in the 1800s, one explorer takes off from the uh, western side of Svalbard in a hot air balloon, trying to go to this um, area. And because of um, an accident, he lands on the Kwitoya Island and they, uh, the whole crew have nowhere to go and they die there. And they still have remains of that hot air balloon expedition, his articles and stuff like that. It's a, it's a historical site to go and watch. Look at how close the polar bear is. The bear was swimming and we found it and we got very close to it and it was great. Apart from bears, as I said, one of the most interesting animals here is of course the uh, puffins. Uh, puffins come here during a particular time during the summer. They stay there till it's very cold and then they head to different areas. Um, I don't know how many of you know the wildlife of the Arctic. One of the most beautiful birds absolutely pure white is the ivory gull. Uh, I call them the satellites of the polar bears. In case I see a, a ivory gull flying, I tell my crew saying, maybe there's a polar bear because they, uh, they are like satellites for the polar bears because polar bears hunt, they feed on um, the carcass and they're always around the polar bears, the ivory gulls. Um, while the summer is very bright and sunny, when you start getting towards the end of October, September, then you'll start seeing sunrises and sunsets in the Arctic. And this is a 3 a.m. perspective of the Arctic. It's unbelievable. It doesn't, I mean, anywhere in the tropical region, you will not see this kind of a pink. Um, you'll see oranges, you'll see reds, you'll see yellows. But this kind of a pink in, you know, um, the Arctic is very common during the, <coughs> excuse me, fall area. So this was September 30th, approximately. And this kind of colors are very normal there. It's beautiful to see skies painted in these kind of colors because it's the extreme uh, top of the world and the uh, uh, light is very different there. I was talking to you about this beautiful glacier called Ostfona, one of the most uh, interesting areas to photograph. This is a drone photograph. Um, I have taken the drone maybe about 150 meters above um, this glacier. Uh, this glacier itself is about 100 meters high from the water. So that perspective was possible only because of that. Uh, again, uh, this may seem like a drone shot, but no, I'm actually standing in front of my ship and leaning down and photographing using a wide angle lens. It seems like I'm photographing this from the drone. So uh, these are some perspectives of the Arctic. I uh, would see if uh, uh, there are a couple of questions before I take you on a long flight from the Arctic to Antarctica. I think there are a couple of interesting questions there. Um, so apart from just animals, the landscape itself is so picturesque. There are so many ice formations, the so many landscapes with glaciers, which is a beautiful sight to see and photograph. Um, also, for a wildlife photographer, you'd always love to get close to an animal. And this was one occasion where the polar bear came to my ship. And from the lower bunker, I opened the window and photographed this from the lower bunker of the ship and I could get this perspective of the polar bear. Otherwise, it's very dangerous to be close to polar bears. I'll just take a quick 30 second break, see some comments there. Um, what is the IS, ideal ISO? Uh, well, um, ideal ISO depends on how much light is there, Mr. Kulkarni, it could be changing depending on the light. So I would decide that based on the shutter speed. One interesting thing for photography buffs here is when we are photographing wildlife in the Arctic, especially when everything is white, we would do something called as a positive exposure compensation. In other words, we will overexpose the pictures because the camera thinks everything is white. It's getting overexposed. The camera is not able to decipher the whites as that's how it is. So they misunderstand the whites and they think it's overexposing. So we basically need to overexpose the camera by doing a little plus. I don't want to do a photography class here. I'm sure others may not be into photography. But anyway, th that's, uh, that's the interesting thing about polar bears and the Arctic. Don't polar bears attack anyone. They are supposed to be very aggressive. Shashi, absolutely right. A lot of people from Norway go to the Svalbard area on kayaking tours. They do kayaking the whole day. They find the nearest um, you know, bank. They set up a tent and they sleep. A lot of people have died because of uh, storing food, keeping fish, keeping meat and whatnot. And polar bears come and attack. So if at all people camp in this area, they're supposed to, by law, carry a gun 
by law have a, a, a guy who's sitting on the watch the whole night while two three people are sleeping one person has to be awake looking around if there's a polar bear at a distance he has to fire uh, fire a, a flare if it still comes close he can fire in the air if it still comes close he or she is allowed to actually kill the bear so that's um, definitely a very aggressive animal because it's starving for months together and it has a uh, very very little fear when it comes to a uh, people and it can come very close and definitely harm people so let's um, uh, on that note um, i hope there was enough information about polar bears i'd like you uh, to go down south to my second favorite area which is of course antarctica in the antarctic region as i said polar bears don't exist sometimes when i'm traveling in antarctica i keep wondering oh my god look at the glacier imagine a polar bear there look at this iceberg imagine a polar bear there so uh, it's very interesting that there are no polar bears in the south likewise penguins have never made it to the north any other predator in the region sanjay um, i mean polar bears um, are of course the top of the food chain there um, there are the arctic foxes which can kill um, if that is a definition of a predator a very interesting story about arctic is a lot of birds colonize during the summer here they they go to the rocky uh, you know areas and they, they lay eggs there and they wait and when the chicks are born there are some rocks where there are hundreds and hundreds of thousands of chicks which are born and it's a cacophony of small chicks shouting around what happens is uh, very interesting the foxes are all waiting in the ground uh, next to the cliff these are called bird cliffs so what happens is when for example this bird called the brunish gulimat i'll just type that uh, name b r u n i c h u l l i e t m o t i hope the spelling is right now um, this bird after they grow to be about 3 4 weeks they have to take a leap of faith from the rock um, which is the bird cliff and they have to glide about 200 300 meters from the top of the cliff all the way to the sea now this is where a lot of chicks die by mistake they their take off is wrong and they land on the ground once they land on the ground they get hit by the ground that itself will injure their wings and legs and maybe even head and they die if they don't die of that the foxes are waiting for some of these chicks to fall down on the ground and immediately foxes run there and bite one two three four sometimes i've seen foxes hold three four chicks and run into a burrow foxes know the art of saving food for the winter they carry a lot of chicks in their burrow put it in the burrows Uh, but some of the chicks make it they fly i mean they glide all the way to the water and they splash on the water that's when the adult chicks i mean the adult birds come and join the chick and then they start uh, sailing towards greenland it's a beautiful sight and it's also something which you should experience with a pinch of salt because you know you want the foxes to feed you want the chicks to be alive so it's you don't know whose side you are sometimes you want a photograph of the chick jumping and falling into the water you want the foxes to go and feed so you don't know which uh, it's like in masai mara right the wild beast migration you don't know sometimes whether you are on the crocodile side or the um, you know wild beast side sometimes you want the wild beast to escape sometimes you feel as a photographer you would love to get that action shot it's a it's a very tough decision to make uh, of course so antarctica as i said is permanent landmass um uh, there's a lot of seas around antarctica that are called the subantarctic region and to be honest south america's tip is a probably a continuation of this peninsula called the antarctic peninsula most of the antarctic expeditions happen from the southern tip of south america there are some which happen also from new zealand that's a five day journey from the southern tip of new zealand to uh, antarctica but here from this town called ushuaia which is the southern tip of antarctica it's a 48 hour sail across this place called the drake's passage in between two continents there's this beautiful channel where the ships cross and it's one of the most rough seas that you can experience after this talk if anybody is interested you can google drake's passage and you will see videos that will make sure you don't want to go to antarctica that dreaded seas they are the ships are rocking water is all over the top of the ship and stuff like that but after a few hours there is crystal clear calmness the sea is very very you know calm you can see the reflection of mountains uh, in the sea it's that beautiful once you start getting into the antarctic peninsula so there are two areas in sub antarctic regions where you can find wildlife as well one of them is called the falkland islands uh, the other one is called south georgia you'll be very surprised to know a lot of species of penguins are actually not found in antarctica 
from childhood we have been told antarctica penguins antarctica but a lot of species of penguins are found in the sub antarctic region to be honest very few species of penguins live in the mainland of antarctica most of them live in this sub antarctic region and perhaps the peninsula so what is the peninsula it's this you know precinct which is coming out of south america continuing down to antarctica this area is called the peninsula the antarctic peninsula most expeditions they come to the antarctic peninsula they travel across the coast of this peninsula they take this channel called the lemaire channel and they go back to ushuaia maybe 10 days to 15 days is the normal expedition time some trips do 21 days from ushuaia they go to uh, south georgia from south georgia they go to falkland islands from falkland islands they come to antarctica if you are somebody who would probably go to antarctica in your lifetime i recommend you don't do this because you will be spending most of your time in the sea between here to there to there you out of 21 days 9 days you will be at sea it's not worth it you should either do the peninsula or you should do the sub antarctic region um, to enjoy it it's not possible to see all of them in 9 days so it's better to focus on one area it's like people going to europe right in 10 days they'll see italy rome france that this everything it's not a great idea to see everything you can do uh, a darshan kind of a trip if you want but if you want to see a lot of wildlife like a serious wildlifer focusing on one area is perhaps what i recommend uh, of course there are three species of penguins which are very common here those three together are called the bush tail and one of them is called of course the gentoo g e n t o o one of the most numerous species of penguins the gentoo penguins they are the ones which can adapt to a slightly warmer environment as well otherwise the other two penguins are very very fragile for example this is a penguin called the adeli penguins they are very small probably about a foot in height um, not too uh, large at all like we we have seen penguins which are 4 feet 5 feet on tv right those are called the emperor penguins i'll show you pictures of them later on but uh, these are the second species of bush tail species called the um, adeli penguins the gentoo penguins are very fun because there are hundreds and hundreds of them they allow you to experience them from up close in fact if you st stand opening your legs they may even walk in between your legs they are such bold birds they don't have any fear of humans they can be very close to us as well i enjoy photographing these because they are this tuku 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 fast walking penguins and uh, we may have also seen them doing some very fun things penguins nest on the shore of the sea using pebbles and rocks so they bring 3 4 5 6 rocks and they lay the egg on the rock i think one of the reasons why they use rocks is to ensure the eggs don't roll over into the sea so the the rocks hold the eggs there of course there are these uh, what do you call parasitic birds like the petrels who come and uh, skuas who come and um, you know uh, uh, harm the penguin um, eggs and they take away them but otherwise penguins have a lot of um, uh, birds in one colony and that's how they protect their egg ones when mass nesting happens the casualties will not be too much even if there are casualties i don't know how many of you know something called the arribada of the olive ridley turtles it happens in orissa where hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of olive ridleys come to the sea on one particular day and all of them dig their burrows and lay eggs and go back into the ocean now that is called mass nesting of olive ridley turtles why do they do that because the day the hatchlings come out there are hundreds and hundreds and thousands of little turtles coming out of the soil walking into the sea and even if birds dogs predators what not catch hold of them they will not be all of them dying just a few of them dying that is a coordinated nesting game that the turtles play which is what is called the aribada likewise all species even in masai mara all the wildebeest go to tanzania during uh, maybe the november december jan time and they make babies there that is called the calving season everybody has a calf then so that the casualties of lion hunts cheetah hunts leopard hunts even if they happen won't be too much because every every calf is born around the same time so penguins also do the same they all nest around the same area so that the casualties are not too high look at this as i said from that rocking ocean coming from the south american tip to the antarctica's northern tip the sea is so crystal clear you can see reflections of the landscapes here beautiful landscape this is a place called the lemaire channel one of the beautiful things about the polar regions think about it in the tropical regions where have we seen mountains with snow at sea level 
this is the beauty of these areas where there are mountains with a lot of glaciers, ice, snow, and they are at the sea level. Because of the glaciers, they're also getting into the sea. There's a lot of ice underwater as well. One of the most beautiful things to see. So what's special in Antarctica, like the walrus in Arctic, is of course animals like the elephant seal. Huge animal, probably a few thousand kilos, a huge animal. Uh, it cannot, uh, you know, um, it's basically also a colonizer. A lot of elephant seals live in colonies. In some parts of the peninsula, you can find them. The males have this trunk kind of a thing. When they, when they uh, blow, they are like, you know, they have a trunk. But this is a female elephant uh, seal. And this is also a very interesting species to photograph using a wide angle lens. You can go five, six feet from them and photograph them. Now, an interesting fact about penguins. Um, some of the penguin species, they both take care of their young ones. Like, look at this. Look at the nest there. They have brought some rocks here. I don't know how many of you have watched Planet Earth, where one penguin goes all the way from the rocky hill to the beach to pick up a rock and comes back. And he puts the rock here and again goes back and again brings back. And there is this neighbor who is turning around like this. And once the guy goes away, goes and brings his rock into his nest. Even penguins steal the rocks. Because the lazy fellow doesn't want to go to the beach himself and he's stealing the guy's neighbor's uh, rocks to build his own nest. Here's a pair of penguins. Photographically speaking, I used a wide angle lens to get very close to show this beautiful landscape and also the corner uh, pair because every 15 feet there's a new nest and couples are working together tirelessly to bring up young ones. The beauty of penguins are when the mother is taking care of the eggs, the father goes into the sea in order to feed. And after a few days, comes back, relieves the mother. The mother now goes on a feeding, a feeding frenzy and comes back after a few. Somebody has to be there at the nest all the time. So that's the beauty of the parenting nature of these uh, beautiful birds. Landscape-wise, I feel Antarctica has a lot more variety of ice and landscapes than the Arctic as well. The chunk of ice in Antarctica is huge. It's also a sad story. That means more ice carving is happening. In Arctic, it only happens around the glaciers. In Antarctica, because there's a lot of ice around the islands, you see a lot of big chunks of ice. If anybody has seen Game of Thrones, this looks like the wall in Game of Thrones. So beautiful ice formations, beautiful landscapes is what makes Antarctica a landscape photographer's paradise. Now, just to set a context, this is a ship I am on, which is a 50 people ship. And look at the um, you know, perspective or the scale of the ship in this landscape beautiful areas with great, great uh, visual, um, you know, uh, interesting hotspots. Uh, in Antarctica, like the polar bear, the most dreaded animal is the leopard seal. The leopard seal are dreaded by penguins, are dreaded by small seals, and they are the most dangerous around here. Very few people have seen them underwater while they are in water. We need to have a different diving uh, setup called cold water diving. But otherwise, leopard seals wait in the water, waiting for the penguins to jump into the water so that they can catch them and feed on them. Leopard seals are very dangerous. Even we um, would be very careful sometimes getting off the zodiac, walking into the area. If we see a leopard seal around, we have to be wary of it. Uh, an interesting picture here. Look how the ice is forming. These are small, um, you know, um, what can I say? It's like a leaf forming here when the, when the advent of winter is happening ice formations happen like this, then all these plates join together and become a thick sheet of ice. And in a few weeks, the whole area is a big sheet of ice. That's the beauty of the polar regions. Of course, a lot of birds also here. I don't know how many of you know this beautiful, famous bird. It's called the albatross. A uh, lot of areas in Antarctica have sightings of the albatross as well. And of course, they also have areas where they live with penguins. They feed on um, eggs and uh, chicks and stuff like that. And that's how they coexist with the bushtail species of penguins. In sub-Antarctic regions, there are these penguins like the king penguins. I don't know how many of you know this beautiful orange-necked penguin called the king penguins. They are found in Falkland Islands, South Georgia, and some parts of even South America, which is uh, Punta Arenas and areas like that. Um, the king penguins are the most easier penguins to see and photograph because they are not in Antarctica. They're actually in sub-Antarctic regions. This is a snow blizzard in the South Georgia area. Beautiful kind of a setup to do photography for a wildlife photographer like me. Uh, one of my dreams, of course, this is not my photograph, but I would love to photograph this species of penguins, which I have not done yet. 
I may probably need more than 30 to 35 thousand dollars of budget to even get here, which is why I'm not able to do that, especially now when the US dollar is 84 rupees, 83 rupees. I can only see pictures of the emperor penguins. I would love to go here one day. Uh, maybe in the next six, seven years, I should do this trip sometime, I'm thinking. Uh, emperor penguins have large colonies and they are very, very beautiful. And getting there requires a helicopter from the ship. You have to go to the uh, landing site of the helicopter. From the helicopter landing site, you use sledges and you carry your camera bags and all of that and go to the penguin uh, colony and spend the whole day with the penguins. And in the evening, again, come back to the helicopter pickup point. Helicopter takes you back to your ship and you spend the night in the ship. The $35,000 trip. Hopefully sometime in my life, I would hope to do that. Well, um, I think that's uh, pretty much what I wanted to show you about these areas with some wildlife of the Arctic and Antarctic. I'm happy to take questions. Uh, if anybody has, uh, oh, 60 participants, very good. I didn't expect so many. Um, happy to answer any questions, please. I'm, I'm done with my presentation. Uh, in fact, at one point of time, it was 69, Jayant. Ah, okay, great. <laughs> nice. <laughs> Okay, uh, there's a question from Mona. Uh, if at all one has to plan a trip, which is the place to start with, Arctic or the Antarctic? Is there an orientation well in advance to know more about planning the trip? So Mona, um, um, I think depends on what species you want to photograph. If you want to photograph the polar bears, of course, the Arctic. I feel doing the Arctic first uh, is um, a better thing uh, than doing Antarctica because Arctic is more approachable, easier, shorter. It also has um you know a lot of expeditions it has a longer season than antarctica and most importantly it has the polar bears so if you're spending ten thousand dollars um you would probably get the wildlifers kick of seeing polar bears than seeing penguins so start with the arctic you will fall in love with it. it's like it's like in india asking whether you should see tigers or you should see you know um, some other rare species of something so i would say go with the flagship species antarctica is great to do but maybe start with the arctic um, the season for arctic is july august september uh, if you are a photo enthusiast if you would like to travel with photographers please get in touch with me i would share some information about how i operate arctic otherwise if you're not a photographer you should go on a larger ship with people who are enthusiastic about wildlife maybe 50 60 people but I go with people like 12 people, which are very, very, you know, um, small group where you can get close to polar bears. With larger groups, you can uh, not get so close to polar bears because everybody will be in each other's frame. So they'll stay a little farther. So definitely try Arctic um, before you go to the polar bear area. Right. Well, Kiran Kulkarni is asking about white balance. Honestly, uh, stop using um, the white balance, uh, you know, in your head. Don't even worry about it. Please shoot raw. If you shoot raw, White balance doesn't matter. White balance is a parameter used to set on JPEG files. On the raw file, please shoot an auto white balance or daylight white balance or cloudy white balance. Come back to the comp and when you're editing, you set the correct white balance. White balance is a post-processing setting in the camera itself. If you shoot raw, you don't need to worry about it in the camera, sir. Uh, thank you, Mona. Um, uh, okay, with respect to Apex Predators, what keeps their numbers in check? Starvation? Well, Bharat, um, one of the biggest problems for polar bears is, of course, climate change, global warming. And you might be surprised to know <laughs> human being. Uh, Russia and Canada, as we speak, still hunt polar bears. For what? For trophy. They don't have any use of polar bear. They'll use the skin to make a stuffed polar bear. And uh, that's how even Russia and Canada still hunt polar bears. But everywhere else in Europe and America and everything, they have signed the treaty. They won't hunt polar bears for fun, at least. There are some communities in Canada called the Inuits. They used to be called the Eskimos. Now that is termed as the wrong word. Inuits are the right word. They still are allowed to hunt polar bears because that's what they've been doing for a long time. But apart from that, uh, polar bears have a much more, it's like, it's like um, diabetes. You can't see it, but it keeps killing you. Global warming, habitat loss, um, climate change, glaciers are not there, ice is not there. Because ice is not there, there's no prey species. When there's no prey species, polar bears don't have anything to eat. We've seen a lot of polar bears die on islands stranded. So that is something which is one of the biggest worries. On that note, I must tell you, a lot of Indian wildlife photo enthusiasts, right, kind of, you know, I can't call it a troll, but keep poking me saying, Are sir, in our country there are so many things in India. Why do you have to go so far to 
you know, photograph this. Please make stories about the tiger in Sundarban or this and that. So I have a perspective on this. As a wildlife enthusiast, I do not care about the political boundaries of this world. Uh, I am as happy to photograph a snow leopard in Pakistan as I am in Spiti. And also, irrespective of that, one important thing to notice, the not so informed wildlife enthusiast thinks apna desh, apna boundary, amara desh mahan, amara tiger mahan. But if we don't take care of areas like the Arctic and Antarctic, which are the ice caps, and they are melting because of global warming, the very Sundarbans tiger that we all love so much will be the first one to die because of the water level rising and the tigers getting into a problem. So it's very important as wildlife enthusiasts and all of you who are ambassadors of wildlife to educate your world around you that you know boundaries are for political reasons and visa and all of that. When it comes to nature, they don't care about boundaries. So we shouldn't care about their boundaries. We should appreciate this uh, planet as a whole. And I care about the tiger in Sundarbans as much as I care about the polar bears. And uh, because I'm fortunate to go there, I would love to go there again and again. Uh, Nahar, uh, one question. Are these areas you covered are protected areas where legal protection is available? If yes, how the conservation protection takes place? Nahar, um, Svalbard is a protected area. Norway administers Svalbard. But there's a lot of Arctic in Russia, a lot of Arctic in Canada, where there's nobody to ask anything. In Canada, as it is, there are no people. In that huge landmass, very few people. Imagine somewhere on the long coast of Canada, there is somebody hunting polar bears. Nobody will come to know also. So Canada and Russia are being forced by the world to sign the treaty and stop hunting polar bears. Apart from that, they are protected everywhere else. Uh, thank you, all of you, uh, sending some nice appreciative messages. I really appreciate that. Um, any other questions, I'm happy to answer. If I miss something, please uh, point me to it. Um, so, Jayant, uh, uh, thank you very much for this wonderful uh, thing. I've seen a great a lot of appreciation, uh, which I see in the uh, chat box. And I think everybody is uh, absolutely, uh, you know, knocked over with the images and the tour. Um, Many of us may not be able to afford ten thousand dollars, so you just made it easy for us to have a trip to the Antarctic. And so, 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 how much is it? Ten thousand plus ten thousand dollars is that twenty thousand dollars? Should we say? <laughs> yeah, but as I said, if you're not, um, you know, particular about photography, you can do it much lesser. Yeah. Uh, the issue is how many people you want with you. Just on a lighter what? note, I was just saying that you just, ah. uh, you know, uh, took oh. us on a twenty thousand dollar trip. <laughs> And uh, I'm, I'm sure uh, I think this is not something that uh, everybody gets to see. And um, uh, I see that uh, Shashi has got a question. Shashi Pabati, I request uh, him to unmute himself and uh, ask the question. Shashi, go ahead. Yeah, hi. Uh, good evening, everybody. Jayant, uh, it was an excellent presentation. The first thing is, uh, I'm very intrigued that uh, you have this uh, real guts to go into such unexplored places to have a look at all these uh, places and other things. That really is amazing. Like a lot of people just go to the neighborhoods and get some photographs. But I have never seen any such uh, photographs of polar bears. You know, thanks to Sanjay and other guys, you know, this. That was an amazing, amazing presentation. But uh, don't you feel scared going into such places? Like you were born in India. And uh, doesn't this minus temperature affect you? How do you take care of such uh, vagaries of nature and things like that? I mean, I just wanted right. to ask that simple question. That Paul. No problem. So I've realized um, it's, it's basically, um, you know, uh, getting used to something. Um, I When I went there for the first time, I was not prepared. I didn't have the right shoes. I didn't have the right inner wear. I didn't have the right apparel to protect myself. But now that I'm there for a dozen years, I have learned how to, um, you know, um, protect myself. So basically, how you dress in the Arctic is very important. Like there's an inner layer, your skin should always have wool on it so that there's warmth. Then you wear the first layer, the second layer, then you wear the last layer, which is called, um, you know, it's a technical word called the Gore-Tex layer, which is breathable, but water cannot go inside. So that's the kind of clothing. Um, I'm not, uh, I mean, as a nature, I am a little audacious. I make a lot of uh, decisions which are not, um, you know, uh, I, I don't know, even from the fact that you know when i quit my it job my mother said the same thing saying you know how can you quit the accenture job and start doing photography and things like that i guess some of us have this um you know um what can i say i don't know if it is um it's madness to an extent uh it depends on uh, you know i feel you know i i 
I have made a lot of sacrifices in personal life from even restricting myself from starting a family to things like that because I'm so focused on what I want in life. So I think that way, these are all very small problems to handle, sir. Thanks, Jayan, for the very candid uh, uh, Thank answers. You. Thank you very much, Jayan. Sanjay, uh, would you like to uh, ask a question? Sanjay, I see that yes. you raised your hand. Yes, yes. Uh, yes, Jan. Uh, uh, it's my, you know, uh, ambition to visit Antarctica before I die, at least, you know, uh, once I should go. Uh, but uh, people are saying, you know, that they may close it for tourists. That's something that is bothering me. Uh, mm. I am sure that it will take a long time for me to collect uh, $10,000. <laughs> <laughs> so can you just throw some light on how what 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 it is yeah so i think um, in the last 10 years there's a lot of tourism which has increased here um now i've seen a lot of rules changing for example if you want to go to um, one island um, you have to uh, take prior permission because nowadays there are 500 people ships 600 people ships coming there imagine 600 people landing on an island there'll be more people than penguins in some areas so with more tourism, more restrictions will come in place. Some researchers want this place for themselves. So they are batting for closure of tourism. But tourism is very required. So I'm sure they'll have to maintain a balance because if there's no tourists, Antarctica won't get money. The world cannot keep don donating money there. So I'm sure there'll be some form of tourism, but I expect it to keep getting more and more restrictive over the years. Um, like, like I was saying, when I used to go to Kabini in 2004, morning safari i go to the tiger tank sit in the watchtower with some snacks and some you know soft drinks and water till the evening safari evening safari guy comes picks me from the watchtower we continue the evening safari and come back to the resort at night can you imagine that today even five minutes after 9 30 they're not allow you to be in cabin so that was the time and now it's evolving likewise even in uh, um, antarctica things are changing we need to take permission now two boats cannot land in the same island at the same time sometimes we have uh, anchored in one place waiting for that boat to get into the ship uh, i mean that crew a uh, number of people to get into the ship so that we can go closer and stuff like that but i don't think they'll block it forever for tourists sanjay because there's a lot of money and without money conservation cannot happen yeah thank you thank you thanks jen so I think uh, uh, there are some questions about uh, you know uh, when to when you're going to take people there. So maybe you can leave uh, your contact on the chat, uh, Jain, so that people can get in touch with you. And uh, sure, sure. I think Sudha knows uh, everything she needs to know about me. But uh, <laughs> uh, she's going to take us through her paintings to Antarctica before I take anybody. I think so. Uh, my website is called tohold.in. Um, happy to answer any questions. And we conduct photography tours. Anybody wants to get into photography, most uh, welcome to. Um, OK, can you text the last layer of your clothes, which is breathable? So Prosen, it's called Gore-Tex. It's a technology. Um, it's called Gore-Tex. It's basically a technology where you your body is perspiring, right? You want the um, you know cold from outside not to come in, but you want the heat to go out when it's too much. It's called breathable thing. So it's a one-way traffic. No cold comes in, but it, it is breathable. So that is Gore-Tex. Thank you for asking. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you for wonderful presentation and this this much. Just as it looked like we were sitting on planet Earth. Mein baithe hai. <laughs> and you are the live like Harsh Gogle, huh? So nice of you. Thank you very much. Thank mm -hmm. you. God bless you. Thank you. Thank you, Jayant. Uh, you know, before everybody goes away, I have an announcement to make as well. So, um, you know, before other questions come in, I would request Rashmi to please present uh, the invite. Uh, I would also take this opportunity on behalf of uh, the International Fellowship of Rotarian Photographers to welcome you to the photography exhibition of. Uh, uh, Tang on its Saturday Photography Club, as well as International Fellowship of Rotarian Photographers. The photograph uh, exhibition is from 11th to 13th, but we have a rotary event on the 12th in the morning between 11 and 12. I request uh, all of you to please join us and encourage us. And um, if anybody also would like to be a part of the International Fellowship of Rotarian Photographers, you can get in touch with me. Uh, you can, uh, you know, also start uh, a fellowship of uh, Rotarian photographers in your area. If you don't have one, I encourage you to do that. 
And if you're in Bangalore and uh, you are here this next weekend, um, I would uh, want you to come to the Chitrakala Parishad and uh, the pictures will be up from the 11th afternoon onwards and uh, the 12th uh, morning we have the event, but you can come anytime between the 11th afternoon and uh, sing. we have close to around 125 images uh, from more than 40 photographers. Uh, the idea is to encourage photography and uh, uh, encourage uh, you know participation and fellowship uh, using photography as a medium. So please do join in and I'll be very happy all, all of you come over and be a part of this uh, exhibition. Thank you very much. And uh, uh, any other questions for Jayant? Uh, please let me know. Uh, <clears throat> one question, sir. Uh, Jayant, slightly a different uh, question than this. Uh, how is uh, uh, Alaska? Huh. Katamai so National... Uh, park yeah. so alaska uh, especially katmai national park you will see brown bear uh, not the polar bear um, so it's a great place to see uh, polar bears fishing salmon so um, katmai um, is very close to another area called the kodiak it's a subspecies of the brown bear called the kodiak bears so if you want to see brown bear like behind you um, on the screen uh, that's a great place to go i actually go to another area called kamchatka in the far east of russia where I see brown bear hunting. Um, it's a cheaper place and it's a much more wilder area. Um, Katmai and um, the Alaskan area has a lot of American tourists in the summer. Getting a booking there to see bears in a falls called the Brooks Falls is very tough. You need to book three years in advance. But if you can get your booking there, it's a great place to go. Which place you said in Russia? Uh, Russia, it's called Kamchatka. K-A-M-C-H-A, Kamchatka. So you, you, if you have my number, ping me later. I will share information. Yeah, I will. I, I, I will. I will. Kamchatka uh, uh, is a place where um, you see brown bear hunting salmon. So that's a beautiful uh, sight as well. Where, what is this photo behind you? Is that your photo? Yeah, uh, my own. I mean, I, uh, last uh, month I had been to uh, Grand Teton. Oh, I see. Nice. Very nice. Uh, Yellowstone and Glacier I covered yeah. one of the very good. Very good. Jain, there's a question here. Have you seen you. photograph of Siberian tigers? Uh, yeah, Bharat. Uh, so, you know, it's it's like um, probably the ultimate uh, price for anybody. I don't think I have it in me to photograph Siberian tigers as of now. When I say have it in me, I mean the budgets uh, and the amount of time I need. So maybe in the future, that's one of the big cats I've not seen. Just for records, I have photographed snow leopards, lions, cheetahs, and every big cat in the world except even pumas, even jaguars, but not Siberian tigers because it's not easy to see them. Only recently, camera traps are getting records of Siberian tigers. Maybe in five years' time, somebody will crack the uh, art of showing Siberian tigers. Until then, I don't know how else to find it. I'm, I'm, I'm not seen and photographed one. Sanjay, that's all the questions right now. Over to you, Sanjay. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Shankar. Um, and uh, thanks for, uh, thank you, Shankar, especially for connecting me to Jain way back in 2009. <laughs> because of uh, you, we were able to, you know, I was able to meet Jain. And of course, we were able to travel to Kenya as well. Uh, let me tell you, uh, Jain, uh, I don't think I have done a wildlife trip like that uh, after that, you know, after 2009. I'm, I really look forward to, you know, bring some of our members uh, with you. I know the way you conduct the tours and uh, the, you know, it's just not the wildlife uh, or the photography. It's also the comfort that we get when we are traveling. I traveled with my family, with my seven-year-old daughter then, and it was so comfortable. Thank you. And I'm sure we will come back uh, with, uh, you know, to you for uh, trips like that. And uh, uh, how many of us are ready to go to Arctic and Antarctica now? Uh, I think, uh, Jayant, uh, uh, thanks uh, for those of us who may not be able to go there. Uh, you have taken us there virtually. And uh, uh, for us, uh, who knew penguin as just one particular type of uh, uh, um, uh, bird, uh, it was an eye-opener. Uh, 
and you also somebody asked me you know before the session that are you going to talk about conservation i said no he's generally going to talk about uh, arctic and antarctica so the uh, so uh, you also spoke about you know you made your point about you know how wildlife has no boundaries i'm really grateful for that comment um uh, and um, thanks to all the members who have participated from different parts of india and also different parts of world i see members participating from kenya bangladesh uh, kampala um, uh, uh, thank you so much and uh, thank you rashmi uh, for uh, uh, those wonderful posters and uh, shankar for moderating the session last but not the least thank you jayant uh, i think uh, we will look forward to having more sessions in future uh, about different uh, uh, you know parts of the world uh, from you thank you so much very kind of you thank you very much thank you jayant thank you thank you